It is now my pleasure to welcome you to our fourth and final block of the forum, which will focus on patient, family, and donor research priority settings. We will have two workshops where you can participate and engage with other participants. The first workshop before the midday break will focus on artificial intelligence and is entitled Using Machine Learning to Enhance Equity and Access in Organ Donation and Transplantation Health Systems patient perspectives. Patient partners Shilpa Raju and Sandra Holdsworth, along with Dr. Mamatha Bhatt, Dr. Suze Burkhout, and Cherry Zhu will lead this workshop. So um, Shilpa Raju is a double lung transplant recipient and a patient partner co-lead with CDTRP's research theme dedicated to engineering and allocating a better graft. Outside of her patient partner and organ donation advocacy work, she is a communicable disease epidemiologist and works for public health in Ontario. Sandra Holdsworth is a 26-year liver transplant recipient living with chronic kidney disease and is involved as a patient partner in many different committees and research projects. Sandra is also the patient partner co-lead of CDTRP Theme 5, Restore Long-Term Health. Dr. Mamatha Bhatt is a scientist in the Ajmira Transplant Center at the University Health Network and is also assistant professor at the University of Toronto's Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. Dr. Suze Burkhout is an early career clinician investigator and a practicing psychiatrist. Her research focuses on the importance of lived experience in relation to knowledge in and of medicine and related to mental health especially. And finally, Cherry Zhu is a research student working with Dr. Bhatt. She recently graduated from a Bachelor of Health Sciences at McMaster University and has been working on liver transplantation research for around three years. And with that, over to you. Thanks, Amy. Sorry, just quick disclaimer for anyone. I hope it's not too noisy. Um, Terry mentioned, sorry, Amy mentioned that I am a double lung transplant recipient, but also now over long term with immunosuppression, um, I also have some kidney challenges. So traveling at the moment, I'm at in a dialysis center, so there may be some strange noises, but please excuse the, the background noise. With that, thanks everyone for joining us today for this workshop. So we're in the early stages of a grant application for a project that aims to take a look at the application of artificial intelligence or AI in organ donation and transplant and how this could relate to and improve equity and access in transplant medicine, which is very exciting. So this workshop is an important piece of developing that application and the work because it gives us a chance to consult with other PFD partners and this awesome network of individuals with lived experience. And this will help us shape those research questions and consider the things that matter to us as patients. So we know that this area of AI can be pretty complex. So we wanted to start the session with a little primer on what AI and machine learning actually is and what it currently looks like or has the potential to look like in transplant. Sherry, who is one of Dr. Mamata Butt's students, will get us started with the overview, after which we'll have a little time for some questions. And after that, we'll be split into two breakout rooms where, um, courtesy of Stephanie, uh, we'll, we'll have some discussion centered on two of our research aims. So there'll be about 25 minutes for discussion with five minute break after that, and then followed by a report back for about 20 minutes. And at the end of the session, we'll post a survey um, link. So if you're interested in getting more involved in some of this research, you can share your email with us and we'll keep you in the loop. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to Shady. Thank you. 
Um, good afternoon, everyone. Should I share my screen with these slides? Okay, sounds good. All right, so my name is Cherry, and as I said before, I am a research student with Dr. Bud. Uh, it is really a pleasure and an honor to meet everyone here today to talk about the uses in, uh, of artificial intelligence in transplantation. So I will actually get to some of the basic information about artificial intelligence and transplant, and then Dr. Bot will take over to talk about some of the cool research that's currently being conducted in the field. So let's get started. So these are some of the disclosures that we have with regards to this presentation. The learning objectives for this presentation are, one, what exactly is artificial intelligence? And within that, what is machine learning? Secondly, as said before, what are some inequities in transmutation and what are some of the challenges related to these inequity issues? And lastly, how can we use artificial intelligence and machine learning in transplant medicine to hopefully resolve some of these inequities? So firstly, what is artificial intelligence and what is machine learning? Artificial intelligence may sound like a big term, but it essentially boils down to intelligence that is shown by computers. And intelligence can include many, many things. It can range from the ability to learn, the ability to logically reason, and the ability to problem solve. And we can teach computers to do all of these. Among the many definitions that we can throw to define artificial intelligence, the simplest way to understand this would be technology, such as computers, that can actually act and use skills that are similar to humans, and we can use these computer systems to solve problems or reach a specific goal. A few examples to illustrate this would be things like chatbots. So if you open a website, you can talk to the website and get your questions answered without actually having to reach a staff. And that chatbot is actually doing automatic response to you at a very fast rate. Other things can include like facial recognition. So when the computer or when the system recognizes your face and grants you entry into a system or into a doorway, that's the computer using human-like skills to recognize you. And in specifically in medicine, uh, AI or artificial intelligence can assist in surgeries and can also predict diseases. The dis disease prediction part, we will come, come back to it and talk about it within the research fields as well. So now that we know a bit more about artificial intelligence, what is machine learning? When many people talk about artificial intelligence, what they actually mean is machine learning. If you see the big uh, circle on the right side of the screen, machine learning is actually a field within AI or artificial intelligence. Machine learning specifically allows machines or computers to become more accurate and better at making predictions without telling it uh, what to do explicitly. So this would require computers to find hidden patterns in very, very large data sets, so large that humans may not even have the capacity to go through, but the computer can go through them readily and find hidden patterns that we humans might not be able to identify. Within machine learning, we can subdivide that as well into smaller fields like deep learning, which are a type of machine learning. There is a very cool pipeline to machine learning that talks about essentially how machine learning works to make these predictions. So as it says in the name, the machine, which will likely be a computer, it will actually collect and process a lot of those input data. So those large data sets that us humans might not be able to manually go through, the machine will collect them and they will true, the, true up those data, study those data and find the computer process that connect it to, uh, connect the data to an output prediction. So these computer processes are called algorithms. And they basically find those hidden patterns within those input data and connect it to an output. And then the computer will collect all these output predictions. And then lastly, but I think most importantly, it'd be uh, important to actually train the process. So train the computer until its predictions are actually accurate within the real world. So the four steps are to collect those large data sets, true up the data sets so that we can connect the input data to an output prediction. And lastly, really train and optimize the computer process so that its predictions are actually true in terms of the real world. 
as cool as it sounds, machine learning has some challenges that are or currently facing. For instance, there can be trust issues from both patients and physician sides. Do we trust that the computers being safe with the data that were put into them? And do we trust that computers' predictions are actually true? And if so, how do we actually uh, make sure that they're actually true so that we can uh, enforce the trust in, among the healthcare practitioners as well as patients? We also really need large and clean data sets to train and to optimize the algorithm as said before. And lastly, we need to broadly test these algorithms to ensure that they are robust. And this needs uh, testing across many research sites and validating those processes to make sure that they're actually accurate. Now we move on to talking about some of the equity issues in transplantation. And this is a very challenging topic because it involves a lot of the sex and ethnic disparities within access of organs uh, in terms of uh, receiving an organ for disease for, from disease donors. So within liver transplantation, we use a score that's called the melt sodium score. It essentially determines your position on the transplant wait list uh, to receive an organ from a diseased donor. When you have a very, very high melt sodium score, that usually means your disease status is very severe, and that means a likelihood or higher likelihood of getting a donor sooner. However, the score has many drawbacks that has led to a lot of disparities and inequity issues within transplantation. Um, so for one, we know that the melt sodium score was actually developed back when the most major indication for liver transplantation was hepatitis C. And within the years, it actually has shifted from that to a lot of uh, fatty liver disease, whether it be alcohol related or non alcohol related. And so this shift in transplant patients or transplant recipient has led to the melt sodium score being not that accurate at making predictions and uh, giving a overview of how severe the disease status is and has led to disparities in who uh, should receive the next organ. Secondly, the melt sodium score, it's a linear model. So it is really great at identifying straight line or linear relationships between different variables. However, we know transplant and diseases, they're a complex thing. There are many not straight line relationships and the melt sodium score is not that great at identifying those non straight line or nonlinear relationships and making nonlinear associations to actually uh, end a, with a good prediction. So that is also one of its limitations. And lastly, it has been found to significantly disadvantage female patients, especially. So for female patients, they often need a much higher melt sodium score before they can actually receive an organ from a diseased donor, which is not good. In terms of the outcomes after liver transplantation, we've seen worse outcomes for specifically Hispanic and African-American patients. Um, we're not sure about what's driving this, but many research out there are showing it could be because of the uh, donor status. So a lot of older donor might come in uh, for those who are seeking transplantation and who are Hispanic, and that may be driving the worst outcomes section. So that is it for the inequities and a basic overview of artificial intelligence. I will now pass it on to Dr. Bot to talk about some of the cool and recent research in the field. Wonderful. So that was excellent. Thank you, Terry. Uh, so very nicely presented uh, this this introduction. So um, excellent job. So just uh, just to tell all of you, you know, Terry has been uh, with my research program for two years now, over two years. And uh, this is through the multi-organ transplant uh, student research training program. So the MOTSRTP uh, at UHN. And uh, we're very fortunate to get, you know, bright students joining us uh, in transplant research uh, through that program. And uh, Terry is going to be starting medical school in September at the University of Toronto. Exciting. Yeah, which is exciting. <laughs> so uh, we're hoping that she'll continue along uh, with this line of research uh, with uh, with my group. Um, so now uh, we'll we'll delve into some of the projects that we've been working on. Uh, I'd ask Cherry if you could 
please continue advancing the slides. So um, why is machine learning of interest in transplantation? So um, when we look at transplant medicine and the whole process, the trajectories over time, um, there's so many different complex pieces of data, complex blood tests, uh, clinical parameters, different types of data uh, that come up during the whole process. And the reality is that we as transplant physicians or transplant surgeons, transplant um, uh, care team members, uh, we're subconsciously integrating all of this data to generate our own predictions. And you know, when someone has a lot of experience in transplant medicine, uh, those predictions may come more easily, more naturally, because they have had training on several uh, individuals, several patients who have come through uh, with different presentations and different pieces of data uh, that then lead them to have a certain prediction. So um, the reality is that one size doesn't fit all. And uh, really, machine learning provides us with the opportunity to integrate all the complex pieces of data, because the reality is that the human brain may be good at assimilating and integrating many pieces of data, but historical data, say all the longitudinal data points over time, uh, may not be remembered, may be difficult to track down, et cetera. Um, and so say a computer is able to assimilate all this complexity and uh, train on this for predictions, uh, that really would be uh, ideal to permit personalized medicine. And so this is the reality in transplantation. There are so many different factors, so many complexities in the blood tests, uh, different dynamics, in the blood tests over time. There's different types of data, including imaging, wearables, uh, molecular data. So molecular meaning, say, gene profiles, different types of profiles. And in terms of applications in transplantation, uh, we have from the donation, donation perspective, we have the identification of suitable organs or donors. So um, additionally, what is the optimal match of the donor organ with the recipient? and waitlist prioritization. So patients on the waiting list, we know that um, as Cherry was mentioning, the melsodium uh, is not a good reflection of severity of disease uh, across all patient subgroups. So certain populations, uh, including women and uh, those with certain types of liver disease are not well reflected uh, because the melsodium was trained on a hepatitis C heavy data set. And so this results in issues in terms of prioritization, inaccurate prioritization. And then machine learning can also help in terms of prediction of outcomes after transplant. And these are different applications. We have published recently a few papers that you can see here in uh, Journal of Hepatology, as well as Hepatology International on the applications of machine learning and liver transplantation. And um, so these are the references in case you're interested in looking into this further. And there are different, say, applications as uh, Cherry has brought up on the screen here. So uh, measuring or quantifying the amount of fat in the donor liver to determine whether that organ is suitable for transplantation or predicting the likelihood of uh, recidivism uh, among transplant candidates. So there are different types of applications that uh, certainly are um, present across uh, transplant medicine. And so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, a new machine learning tool that we've developed. Uh, so this was funded uh, by a CIHR grant, uh, actually, um, uh, so a, a few years ago, uh, so just over a year ago, actually, uh, we had received a bridge grant uh, and now again, we've received another grant uh, uh, as a follow-up uh, for this particular study. So this is um, analysis performed by uh, Michael Cooper and uh, Rahul Krishnan. And uh, we've been very fortunate also to have Sandra uh, Holdsworth as a patient partner on this project. 
Uh, so Michael Cooper is a PhD student in computer science who has done all of this uh, analysis. Um, and we've been meeting on a weekly basis to uh, say continue uh, the discussion around uh, this particular project. So um, we trained this model uh, given, given the inequities on the waiting list, uh, we felt um, I felt strongly that uh, you know we needed to work towards changing uh, the prioritization system and to make it more equitable. And so um, we trained uh, different deep learning models. Uh, so to leverage our access to longitudinal data on the waiting list. Um, so on over 120,000 patients who were listed for transplant in the US, uh, these were patients with decompensated cirrhosis of different kinds. Um, um, so could have been due to fatty liver disease, alcoholic liver disease, hepatitis C, et cetera. Um, and there were 342 static and time varying characteristics per patient, meaning that there were different blood test results or clinical data points um, in each patient uh, that were available from the scientific registry of transplant recipients. And so uh, we developed this uh, model actually. Uh, so it's called Dynameld, and basically it leverages these longitudinal changes in blood test results, as well as uh, rates of change to uh, better prioritize uh, patients on the waiting list. And we have a certain function that we have applied additionally to um, make it even more uh, accurate. And in fact, uh, our model in the end, when we uh, look at the simulating uh, allocation outcomes, uh, we determined that in fact, our um, uh, formula, our uh, particular tool, would be able to render equitable the pre-transplant mortality uh, between uh, women and uh, uh, men on the waiting list for transplant. And so this provides us with the, uh, with the promise of um, removing those inequities. And in fact, our model also, when we tested it on the UHN data set, so the, the, the latest um, you know, fine tuning and additional, um, say, uh, work on this model resulted in actually very good validation on the UHN data set. So, um, so we discovered, we realized how we could uh, make it work and generalize to the UHN population. And our plan through this particular grant is to be able to um, further validate this model across uh, Canadian center data. And we did have partners from uh, across Canada who uh, were willing to and very interested in participating. So this is a say a very exciting application uh, in my mind and uh, with with very clear potential uh, for impact. Um, so next, in terms of post transplant, so um, in terms of liver transplant recipients specifically. Uh, we have quite a bit of work to do in, in order to ensure that our recipients can enjoy the best possible quantity as well as quality of life. So if we look at long-term outcomes after surviving the first year post-liver uh, transplantation, uh, in the last 30 years, there's not been significant improvements in that regard. And um, you know the reason for that is because there are different conditions uh, that uh, can arise due to either exacerbation or worsening of existing conditions before. And then uh, lifelong immunosuppression certainly has an impact in terms of increasing the risk of cancer, cardiometabolic disease, or, or heart disease, uh, as well as infection. And overall, um, the care of transplant recipients is uh, often based on, say, observational studies, uh, we don't really have, um, say, large-scale clinical trials very often, and so uh, a lot of it is dependent on, say, experience um, at a given transplant center and, you know, data or guidelines that have been gen generated are based on, um, say, limited observational studies overall, for the most part. And so... Um, how can we use machine learning to change this and turn transplant into a cure? So with this in mind, uh, we looked at 
um, this particular problem of predicting trajectories after uh, liver transplantation and how we could optimize those trajectories. And so this was a paper that we published in Lancet Digital Health two years ago with Bo Wang uh, as um, um, collaborator and uh, these two trainees, so Oswald and Amir, who uh, drove this whole project. Um, so uh, we published this a few years ago. Um, and the idea here was to use um, and examine different types of machine learning tools to um, really leverage all the different patterns and dynamics in the data over time after transplant. So again, as I said, as physicians will often subconsciously integrate all of this data to generate our own, say, personalized predictions. Um, but the reality is that you know, it is quite possible, uh, say, for example, for a model that is trained on over, you know, 100,000 patients to then bring that knowledge into our own institution and try to personalize uh, the approach to care of patients. Um, and so uh, the idea was basically to uh, make a more personalized risk calculator for individual patients to inform a personalized care plan, including modulation of immunosuppression or anti-rejection medication. And so our best performing model for this particular project was called a transformer model, and it was able to, say, predict the risk of different uh, events and associated uh, uh, compromise of survival. So say cancer, infection, graft issues, as well as heart issues, so heart disease. And um, one, so we trained on the large US data set and then tested on our own local data set. And so this was on over 65,000 patients from the US and then tested on over 4,000 patients at UHN. And um, we determined that there was very good generalizability for this particular uh, question and risk stratification. And uh, we now are, um, we have de deployed the front end of a dashboard to uh, generate uh, probabilities of events and associated survival uh, for each individual, and also to provide the list of risk factors, which are either modifiable or not modifiable, that we can then act upon for that individual patient in order to change their trajectories um, after a certain visit. So this could be, say, for example, at time point four years after transplant, one could then project to one year and five years after uh, that particular visit to then give a prediction and say, okay, well, this is the list of uh, issues or items that we need to focus on to optimize uh, your health. And so uh, the idea in the longer term is to make this both a physician and patient facing dashboard. And we've actually facilitated, uh, we're working on the data engineering to permit the flow of data into this dashboard, which is going to be clickable from Epic, which is our electronic medical record system, to be able to generate those individualized or personalized predictions and help um, our patients feel empowered in their care as well. And so what are the future prospects for practical use in transplant medicine? Well, I think overall, uh, this is my own vision uh, for um, say AI in transplantation. And I particularly uh, focus here on liver transplantation because this is my uh, clinical area. So uh, when we look at patients who are listed for liver transplantation, there are dynamics on the waiting list someone could be stable for a very long time and then suddenly have a deterioration in their blood test results due to stressors such as infection or other events that are uh, causing stress on the liver. And this can lead to a rapid decline in the liver status. So um, all of this is uh, say not well reflected by the melsodium, which is just an instantaneous uh, test result, but it doesn't actually consider all the history that has happened up until a certain time point. So uh, with machine learning tools, we have the ability to say use time to time variation in patient data to accurately forecast the future. 
Um, and then again, for liver transplant, donor recipient matching, identification of donors, and then post-transplant predicting issues and complications that we can then help modify and uh, modify ultimately the trajectories of our patients and uh, improve life expectancy as well as quality of life. And uh, so I think uh, that is the overall vision. And uh, I'd like to um, you know, highlight that this is a very uh, exciting step uh, because we have published some good papers in high impact journals, but now we're moving into uh, the deployment and the actual practical application or the practical, um, say, translation of this work into the clinical context. And especially now with AI tools being so uh, pervasive in other contexts, I think this is uh, where there's a lot of excitement and certainly um, you know, we're at the forefront of this effort in, in transplant medicine. So uh, it's very exciting to actually uh, be able to do this. And uh, we have great support from the Ajmera Transplant Center to actually be leaders in uh, deploying such machine learning tools uh, into the transplant setting. And uh, this is, you know, very exciting to me. So I, I lead, I co-lead the Transplant AI Initiative along with Aman Sidhu, and uh, there's just a lot of uh, potential and promise to all of this, I think. Um, so I, with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the, the members of my research team, and I'd like to acknowledge our uh, key uh, patient partners, including uh, Sandra Holdsworth uh, and uh, Susie Kukofikas, uh, who have been um, extremely uh, helpful in their advice and comments. Uh, as well as Shilpa Raju, whom uh, I met more recently, uh, who is now, um, you know, uh, working with us to uh, say uh, support progress in this area, which I think is uh, critical to uh, helping personalize uh, transplant outcomes and uh, transplant progress. So thanks so much, and I'd like to acknowledge as well um, uh, our funding sources. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mamata, and thanks, uh, Terry, as well, for this really great overview. But we did what we wanted to do next was to start to look at some of the um, aims that are part of the uh, part of the project and create a breakout room um, for two of these aims and so that we can have a, a more rich discussion about um, some of the, the components of the project and start to get people's input um, on um, some of the really pertinent issues that, um, that this kind of a project brings up. I am going to encourage folks to turn their cameras on when they are back so I can see who it is and I will roll call round robin for um, our report backs. And so I think maybe because I wasn't in breakout room too, and I am interested in what was discussed, I'll have maybe um, Sandra, are you okay to give your short report back or would you like Suze to go first? Suze is going to go first. Perfect. Well, we'll have group Thanks, two. Thanks, Katie. Of course. Hi, thanks so much. Um, so we had a really rich discussion in um, in room two, and that could have probably gone on for a lot longer. Um, but in terms of the questions we were asking, we were um, first uh, having a discussion about what does equity mean to um, mean to people, and then also um, the other question that we were uh, looking at and thinking about. Um, was what were the ways that equity was going to potentially be interfacing um, with uh, with AI? So how do equity issues potentially come up in AI? And and we really kind of the the two questions kind of merged together in a lot of ways. Um, I you know I think that from um, everyone's discussions it was it was clear that equality and equity are not exactly the same thing. Um, and that, and I think that the sort of ways that people were talking, we were really looking at and thinking about how equity was about um, meaningful fairness. So um, that there can be equality that or things that seem like they're fair, um, but they, they may not be. And so having meaningful fairness or meaningful um, and and part of that meaningful fairness is um, relates to inclusion. And so I think those are, that would be, you know, we didn't sort of land on like a hard definition, but those were the sorts of themes that were that were coming up. And in in the discussion, we also there were sort of three areas that that I think kind of came forward um, 
about that. So one was that um, in order to uh, be able to uh, deal with equity within um, within transplant, there needed to be a way to broaden the scope of what people were thinking about and looking at um, and the kinds of information that was going to be kind of coming in and being part of um, uh, being being part of any kind of machine learning. Um, and so the broadening the scope, one of the points that came up, I think that was really important was that, you know, you could use more like more information. So a broadened scope of information to try to um, help, you know, help create uh, more equitable decisions within transplant. But then, you know, as was pointed out, that information still has to get through the door. So people still have to be in the system to have all that information applied to them. And there's still potentially people based on, you know, gender, based on ethnicity, based on the geography, like rural location, that kind of thing, who aren't even making it to the table. They're not even getting through the door to be considered for part of transplant. So then the if you're going to have a, a you know a, an equity lens, then then there needs to be this this bigger um, sort of scope of that. The other um, and related to that, I think related to equity was around complexity and trying to understand complexity. And so one of the things that was really hoped for was that AI could generate um, uh, better outcomes if you are able to be able to manage more complex information um, within those, like in terms of things like creating more complex models, um, but then to complexify our complexity, we were also talking about how things like scientific data is also sometimes historically already been biased. And so there's um, there has to be some way of attending to that kind of complexity. So, you know, thinking about the ways in which, for example, um, lots of bodies of data are, are built on like, like male bodies in particular, and how that is, we don't want like that dealing with equity means having to try to understand that kind those kinds of complexities, um, in addition to building more complex systems. And then the third aspect that we talked about was transparency, that part of the um, part of the um, aspects of, of ensuring that there's equity in relation to machine learning and artificial intelligence is having an element of transparency around how, for example, algorithms have been created, the transparency, and, and then also communication that makes it clear that brings everyone along so that it's not just um, experts who can kind of understand everything that people um, can um, can be able to be part of the, the discussion so that equity also re re depends on some transparency as well as um, being able to communicate in ways that keep people in the conversation. So that inclusiveness side of things was also part of that. Um, Sandra, any, um, any things you want to add from your sense of what else we were talking about? Yeah, that was great. Something I didn't get to bring up, but that's on my mind. So my understanding from working with Dr. Bat is that AI data that comes out is going to be one tool that's also used with like other tests that we have patient has done, but also how do how do we manage the bias that comes with the clinician who uses their instinct as well? So when we implement these, how is it going to be used? It, you can't just say it's all based on machine learning because you want to be able to use the machine learning, the results and the test, right? Because that's with the individual. But then, you know, you can't take from the person's brain all the knowledge that they've gained, right? Yeah. So then they still want to go back to, the, they might want to still go back to their biases and that as well. So that's just something that we should keep in mind. No, and also for patients an to understand point, that actually, uh, that, That's an excellent point, Sandra. So uh, well. you're absolutely right. Um, I think, you know, given that we're still at the beginning of deployment, um, we would use these predictions as, say, complementary to the physician's expertise. Um, in fact, you know, I was speaking to someone in uh, business. So they said, uh, I was speaking to someone, uh, actually, we had a visit from a uh, French pharmaceutical company, technology officers recently uh, to UHN, uh, to the Edgemarra Transplant Center, and uh, I'd organized this visit. And uh, one of them was 
talking about how um, the ML algorithm uh, in their uh, at their company had predicted something that was in contradistinction uh, to uh, what an expert financial analyst had predicted. Uh, and the financial analyst couldn't believe it and uh, you know refused to believe it. But actually, in the end, the algorithm was correct. Uh, so the uh, the uh, financial analyst, despite years of experience, actually was incorrect in their prediction, but they couldn't trust that the algorithm had made a more accurate prediction than they had. Um, but I think, you know, it could be the other way around too. So I'm not saying that ML is going to outperform the expert in every single instance, but I think, um, you know, it, it, this is uh, permeating throughout different spheres. It's not just, uh, you know, uh, Google and Amazon. I mean, it's uh, in business, it's uh, banking, now in healthcare. So, um, you know, we have to get on with it because, uh, you know, there's uh, really a surge of activity and, uh, you know, we, we want to use that knowledge and that uh, expertise to improve outcomes and transplant in the end. Uh, but I completely agree that, um, you know, uh, people may or may not trust the prediction of an algorithm and uh, may wish to use their own judgment, uh, at least at the beginning when we're still, you know, testing or evaluating these algorithms. Thanks, Mamatha. Um, Chloe, maybe? Yeah, um, so I think in our group session, we talked first about the, the benefits of using AI. Um, I think folks really talked about um, in the post-transplant phase, like early detection of complications uh, and problem solving for the best possible health outcomes, how to predict uh, that the AI algorithm can help predict um, harms in risks associated in the long term, uh, let's say with immuno taking immunosuppressants and kind of keeping a close eye on different um, potential complications that can arise down the line and optimizing the quality of life for long term transplant recipients while still customizing the different dosages and catching risks. Um, and um, refining the way that uh, we do transplant medicine in both standardizing, but also personalizing practices and individual outcomes. Some of the challenges I think um, came up uh, that, that were discussed were how to find uh, and where to get good data, how to build that data structure so that there's enough data to anticipate kind of different prognoses for the next 20 years, making sure there's um, uh, that the data is cleaned up uh, and that the data set, that there's enough data from across different transplant centers. There is uh, also a discussion about how to define outcomes, um, kind of some nuances in terminology. Uh, sometimes it's discussed in terms of mortality and morbidity, but that's not necessarily how patients see it. And so um, kind of uh, thinking of different ways to talk about quality of life, maybe the length and depth of, um, of outcomes as opposed to mortality and morbidity um, and uh, individualizing those goals. Um, some of the risks too, um, someone brought up a, a really great point that uh, the algorithms kind of follow very biomedical model, um, and that sometimes the psychosocial components are lost uh, in the patient experience. And so while the, the algorithm right now still look, takes into consideration social and economic uh, status, there are other components of quality of life that are not collected. Um, and so the, the algorithms... Um, cannot also read or capture body languages or change in tone and, and other aspects that uh, physician and uh, patient interaction might capture. Um, and so some of the concerns too that were discussed were uh, to think about uh, how realistic it is to have uh, clean data sets while working with patients. 
and which requires uh, systematic uh, documentation and cross-checking to make sure that it's reflective of reality. Um, some other concerns uh, were related to the bias of the algorithm, especially taking into consideration um, race and ethnicity and different minorities that might not be captured in, let's say, the Canadian data set um, and, and to take those factors into consideration. And then a kind of um, overall uh, distrust or how to change the culture um, and kind of the skeptics mindset of um, the AI by providing more explanation of how the AI um, came to its uh, predictions and uh, more explanation of that. So I think that, yeah, pretty much covers it. Good, thank you. Wants to add, yeah. yeah, if anyone can add on at this point, I think all four of you did your report back statements. Stephanie is um, letting us know that we've got about 10 minutes left, so we could either have open discussion or if any of the questions from uh, Mamatha's talk earlier didn't get addressed during the discussion that happened so far, we can use that time for that and I will leave it to the group to decide um, what they want to do. I think uh, just to add on um, to Chloe's summary, um, you know, one one important aspect uh, that was brought up was the QOL, uh, so the variables uh, associated with quality of life uh, and improving quality of life to not just focus on risk, but also say quality of life. And um, I think in large data sets, we don't have that kind of data available, but certainly in a prospective manner, this is something that if we collect, then we can certainly include in uh, predictions and um, say personalizing uh, not only quantity of life, but uh, quality of life. Um, and then the, the other thing I'd like to add is uh, uh, the whole, you know, potential to modify trajectories, um, whether it's on the waiting list or post-transplant. I think uh, with machine learning tools, we have that ability or that potential to personalize um, trajectories and help people modify those trajectories and empower them in their own care. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's something that we also um, discussed uh, during my session, as well as uh, dur during the question, uh, sorry, during our, our discussion as well, the breakout. Sonica, we'll do um, Suze and then Ruth, please. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll go quick because I think Ruth probably, I've already gotten to speak and so it'd be great to hear from Ruth who's got a lot of um, expertise and experience in, in this. Um, the question that I had uh, actually came up in relation to thinking about things like, uh, Mamatha, what you were just saying with quality of life, you know, sorts of data being potentially included. And so this is more of a broad question, but I'm curious about if you have any sense of how Let's say that you're feeding information in um, and through that, you also get a sense that maybe there's limitations. So like when I think about quality of life data, I think about all of the limitations of how the quality of life is framed to make it quantifiable and, and then what the challenges of that are. But I'm curious if there's, yeah. if you've had any experience with being able to feed back from the, like what you're producing from the algorithms to feed back into making things like say quality of life, you know, assessments better too. Like, is there like, rather than the whole, like, is there, is there potential for kind of back and forth um, within? There some... is. So I would say, you know, um, algorithms can always be fine tuned. So you can add uh, variables to say enhance performance of prediction. And um, to be honest, I've not included quality of life uh, parameters in uh, my own work so far. I've uh, uh, used, uh, say, you know, at, at UHN or with the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients or with the ICS data, um, all these uh, data were really, say, uh, quantity. Uh, so say continuous variables or binary like one zero or say continuous. So um, so I haven't had that experience, but I would say that um, if, for example, um, for a patient who has a higher risk of a certain outcome, we then implement a therapy or implement a measure 
that then will modify their trajectory, we can feed that data back into the algorithm to then, you know, train that algorithm further. And, um, you know, we can do that so that, you know, now the algorithm takes into account that therapeutic modification and what that means for trajectories from that point. So uh, it is possible to have the model learn as you go. It's, it's kind of, it's the same thing as what we do in, um, like say, as we progress from say medical student to resident to, you know, physician with finally several years of experience, there's ongoing uh, education and ongoing training over time. And so the machine learning model also has that opportunity to learn over time. And, you know, with all the exciting developments in diabetes or cardiovascular disease, whatever, or oncology, you can feed that data back into the algorithm to then provide a different prediction. And that's, you know, simulating actually what we do in real life. You know, the reality is that uh, so many things have changed in medicine, right, in, in recent years. So whether it's RNA nanomedicine, whether it's, you know, in oncology, uh, there, there are so many, you know, new therapies out there. And uh, those are changing trajectories of even the people who are being referred for transplantation. There are many people who are now referred for transplantation who wouldn't have even been candidates, say, five years ago. So. Even the patients we're seeing as referrals are, are continuing to change over time. So we have to continue to train uh, the algorithm. And we may even say, you know, go from a certain point in time in order to discount all the data that uh, may not be training the model uh, in, a, in a way that is appropriate for the current circumstances. Thanks, Monica. We'll have uh, Ruth next, please. Thank you so much. Uh, definitely uh, an exciting topic, I would say, uh, both understanding the advantages and the limitations of this field. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the limitation and the choice of methodology. Um, so um, there are some challenges with uh, most of the machine learning models. The, uh, you alluded to that. The outcome is oftentimes somehow dichotomized. And one of the key outcomes we're interested in transplantation are time to event type of data. And there are methodological ways to deal with those. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, just want to... Uh, uh, your insights with regards to this methodology versus, I would say, decision analytic models so that are used more in the context of uh, uh, economic evaluation. What is the advantage, I would say, again, of, uh, of uh, um, outlining or incorporating inputs and learning about these kinds of trajectories uh, uh, and revising prediction models in the context of AI versus deriving potentially similar inputs from um, a standard statistical analysis and incorporated into economic evaluation models that have quality of life, that have the outcomes of interest. And on top of that, I mean, again, yeah. is additionally, one could incorporate costs as well. Yeah, so I think uh, the answer to that is that, you know, machine learning tools may not be appropriate for certain questions. So if um, if the, the outcome one wishes to predict is, say, uh, susceptible to several variables and in their interrelationships, and, uh, you know, you have several longitudinal uh, data points, um, the reality is that, say, these deep learning models will likely do a better job, uh, but it could also be that they don't do a better job. And so it depends on the data and it depends on the question, I think, in the end. Um, for the questions that my group studied, I think, you know, machine learning models were the most uh, accurate at prediction, particularly the deep learning. Uh, so 
those that considered the longitudinal data, so several uh, data points over time. Um, so in the end, you know, it depends on the question and it depends on the data. So I'm not saying that, say, machine learning tools are the be all end all. You know, it depends on the question. Thanks, Mamatha. There you go, Sandra. I was going to say this will be our last question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're we're we're, um, yeah. we're at time. I wish there was an M at machine learning that could advance time when we need it. But anyway, just uh, <laughs> on behalf of all of us today that presented, uh, Dr. Mamatha Bat and her team and uh, Susie and um, Shipla and everyone, thank you so much.